Good morning and welcome to ICON 2021. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here. I thank Randall and Marvin for making me a part of this momentous event. I love ICON. I always want to be a part of ICON, but this year, totally different, right? It's very exciting if I get to see all of you in person, if we get to energize a whole room filled with people who'd want to learn and maybe have a boost into their life and financial journey. But then again, because of the pandemic, we'll have to do it this way. And I hope we make such a difference nonetheless. Again, for me, it's such a great thing to be able to open this. I think I'm the oldest, if not one of the oldest in this crew of speakers. But I guess Randall and Marvin put me quite ahead of everyone, not because of that age, but because of the topic I'm going to be sharing with you. I wrote a book, Firing on All Cylinders, about a couple of years ago. It's a certified national bestseller. Thank you for all of you who supported it. But when I wrote that book, I was focused on making each and every individual, any reader or any part of the audience, to push and fire and, and work on all cylinders. As I tell them, God has made us to be Ferraris. We have 10 to 12 cylinders. Unfortunately, many people just make four cylinders work. So while we are Ferraris, many of us run like Vios's. Yes, a Toyota Vios with four cylinders. Because the power of the engine can be wasted if we don't fire from oil cylinders. But think about it. Isn't that what's happening today? More so what's happening today. It's unfortunate that when we have a pandemic and a crisis like this, people kind of recede. People somehow, you know, look at all the developments. Some of them wait. They'd like better times to happen. Some of them are in denial. Some of them even get into a fixation of, of self-pity. And when that happens... We'll never win. Those people will never win. So all the more I think that firing on all cylinders becomes more relevant. It is when things like this happen that we will have to do more, that we will have to make sure that we're not just going to be out there to overcome. Oh, sorry. Maybe that's the wrong thing. Not out there. In here. <laughs> As we're all in the comfort of our homes. And from here, we will conquer what's out there. As I can tell you, being locked up in a home doesn't mean you cannot thrive. And yes, you can thrive. And people who have a very different perspective even do better. And that's the reason why I'd really like to make sure that all of us get that point, that growth is an option. Growth is a choice, no matter what's happening out there. It is always an objective, regardless of the situation. Why are you guys here? Why are you listening to me? Because you want to grow. You elected to grow. You are proactively doing things to grow. You can actually just watch a Netflix Telenovela, you cannot probably, you know, get to expose yourself and stuff like this because you'll need to think. Maybe you can doze off and sleep. Many people elect to do that. And when they don't grow, it's not the fault of COVID. Whose fault is it? Of course. It's their fault. And you electing to be here making part of this, you know, making yourself part of this two-day event, learning from, you know, the very best. You know, I, I, I can tell you, 
after this talk, I, I'm not going to switch out and do something else. I will be seated right in front of the same computer to watch each and every speaker because whenever I get exposed to them, I learn, I grow, I get to imbibe things and, and, and lessons that can even make me better. It doesn't stop. Perspectives change with time horizons. I know this pandemic will come to pass. And when it comes to pass, then what happens after? Question becomes, are you a better person than the guy who started entering this pandemic? Are you a better person than that guy before March 2020? See, there are people who are going to get out of this pandemic raring and ready to go because they're better. They've grown. They've morphed into new engines. They know online business. They know how to make them themselves go digital. They can touch base with customers. They can work better. How about you? Are you a better version of that? Or are you waiting for things to go back to the old normal so that you can get into your groove all over again? And if you decided that way, I can tell you, you've already wasted over a year of your life. And you can waste more of that. So obviously, we have to overcome. And on top of that, not just survive, but thrive. It's just a matter of discipline and strategy. And that's the reason why I like this talk. Because I'm going to be moving from a topic called resilience. Yes, Resilience is not an accident. It is something we all work for. It is something we all work at in order to be. To be resilient, again, is a choice. And it can actually require certain strategies, certain thought processes that puts us in a position of power. In a position of power, amidst an environment of problems, concerns, depression, and so many issues. But you see, it's, a, it's exactly like that diamond, that diamond that forms out of cheap and valueless carbon because of the pressure applied to it, because of the heat applied to it. That's who we need to be. Diamonds in the rough that are gonna come out of this pandemic with enough luster. So resilience is a topic. After that, firing on all cylinder ships to business. How are you pushing your business? I know many of you are thinking about business who are already in business and maybe working for a business. No matter what your role is, how have you pushed and fired on all your cylinders to make the business better. Then we shift to investments. How are you firing on all your cylinders to get yourselves into a better investment portfolio, into different asset classes that can probably make your kitty more you know, resilient as well amidst the signs of the times? A portfolio that performs no matter what. That's going to be an issue. Are you doing that? And lastly, are we also firing on all cylinders for our family? Yes, this is such an opportunity because for people like me, I've always focused on the business, the work. And all of a sudden, this whole year or more than a year, I've been put in a situation where I can max out on great relationships, deeper conversations with my wife and kids. Firing on all cylinders within the family and building the relationships certainly will be such a big blessing moving forward. I can already feel it. 
Now, I'd want to be able to share, share this passage with you. I know you're also working through this. So for many of you, it's an affirmation. But for those of you who can pick up certain strategies, certain lessons, certain inputs from me, then it's going to be great. If you can pick up some of these and you know, inject it into what you do today, that can be a big, big plus. That can work absolutely well. So let's get into this topic called resilience. Resilience is the capacity to recover from difficulties. It is the capability to thrive despite the odds. So is it taken in? Is it developed by accident? No. In fact, I'm going to tell you resilience is an output of our responses to certain situations. And that's the reason why we're not supposed to avoid failure, difficulty, and suffering. They are not options. They are part of life. And because they are part of life, they become requirements for resilience. You cannot be resilient if you haven't experienced any difficulty. Resilience is not going to be an experience or a muscle that you develop if you haven't gone through failures. And there's a reason why I can tell you the adversity quotient is very, very important. The adversity quotient or that capability of a person to respond effectively to life sufferings would be a must. So when these things happen, it gives us an opportunity to develop resilience. And developing resilience requires a lot of practice as well. So I'm not going to say be delusional or invite all the pain and suffering in your life and, and maybe want the failure and the mistakes. No, it's not like that. It's more like we know they're going to happen. And since they're going to happen, how resilient are we in our responses? How proactive are we in taking on this resilience issues, this resilience opportunities or opportunities to be resilient? So I guess the grades for people are different. The people who thrive have great resilience, while the people who clamp up are those that have very, very low resilience. They get depressed. They'll have anxiety in their lives. So let us go through strategies, you know, approaches that can improve resilience. And I hope this helps you develop your own resilience moving forward in this pandemic. We're all hoping it's going to be such a short ride from here. But what if it goes longer? What if it gets increased by the new variants? What if the difficulty gets magnified by new issues like vaccination schedules? and rollout systems that fail. We see that happening in government today. Will all these things impact you negatively? And even if you look at the possibility of saying goodbye to this COVID pandemic, won't you need resilience for that next, next thing to overcome? There will always be another crisis, whether it's a health crisis like this pandemic, or it's some other financial, catastrophic calamity, stuff like that. We will all need the resilience and the strategies have to work. But let me begin with discussing what doesn't work. What does not work or what seldom works? Number one is denial. You know it's there, you don't accept it. You deny it. You look the other way. When you do that, obviously, resilience doesn't come to you because you're just avoiding it, hoping that it will go away. 
you're not dealing with it head on. So the opportunity to become resilient doesn't happen. Self-discrimination. Self-discrimination is when you ask yourself even the wrong questions, the worst questions. Lord, why me? Why does this have to happen now? I am at the peak of my career. Why is a year or two years wasted out of this, you know, this track of mine? If we ask those questions, guess, guess what the answers are? The answers are not going to be empowering. See, you ask the right questions and the right answers pop up. You ask the wrong questions and then you become more problematic when it comes to the kind of emotion you're going to have. Technically, when you self-discriminate, you put yourself in a position of weakness. You put yourself in a position of helplessness. And the last one is suppression. You know it's there. You don't deny it, but you suppress it. Hoping again it will go away. Let me, let me prove this point to all of you. Let me try to prove this point. Okay? Uh, can you bear with me? Let's get into an exercise here. At the flick of my finger, I'd want you not to think of something. All of you go through this exercise. Think of anything. Think of anything but a big, large snake. A huge king cobra. Think about anything else, but don't think about a huge snake. Don't think about a large king cobra. Have you done it? How many of you did not think about the snake? How many of you did not have a picture of that snake in your head? That's going to be rare. You're going to be rare. See, when you tell people not to think about something, the more they think it. So many of us actually had this picture in our heads. And that's exactly what happens when you suppress or even deny certain pains, sufferings, failures, and difficulties in your life. You're not supposed to deny them. You're not supposed to deny them. You're supposed to deal with them. Know that they're there and deal with them. So what works? What do resilient people go through? Resilient people know that trials, failures, pain, and suffering are part and parcel of human existence. They know it's going to be there. They're not welcoming it. They're not, you know, delusional enough to bring these things into their life, you know, uh, actively. But they know they will come. And when they come, they react very well. And you see, one of the biggest strategies is asking the right questions. The right questions bring you the empowered perspective. What if this pandemic hits you and you fire on that cylinder and say, what can I learn from this? What can I learn from this? See, once you say, what can I learn from this? What will the answer be? You're going to be looking for things to learn. You're going to be looking for things that will make you grow. But what if the question is, what business can I start in this pandemic? When you ask what business you can start, you're going to think about businesses. And if you already have a business, maybe the question becomes, you know, how can I pivot my business to succeed in this pandemic? So when you ask the right question, you take the empowered road. And when you're on that empowered road, Guess what happens? You become better because you ask the right questions. But you see, resilience doesn't happen only in a pandemic. In any given situation, asking yourself the right questions always make you more resilient. You're in class. 
You have a very boring teacher who doesn't know how to teach. Face to face nga, hindi na marunong magturo. Ngayon pa kaya, naging online learning na. It's a bigger problem, right? But you see, if the question at the back of your head as a student is, what can I learn from him? What can I learn from him? See, what you ask, you're seeking. What you seek, you shall find. So if, if you're asking those right questions, you are going to be learning, no matter what the situation is. How about the question that goes, if I become a teacher, what are the things that I can pick up from this guy that I won't do when I get to his role? See, you're even going to learn from his weaknesses. You're going to be picking up on those weaknesses that you won't do when you're in the same position. How's that for a change? So it is the way you're wired. It is the way you ask that your reactions are framed. You automatically react to something and that reaction can be disempowering or empowering. But if you put yourself in a situation where you act accordingly, then your reaction will be positioned for greatness, positioned for empowerment. So asking the right questions, very, very important note. Resilient people are also good at choosing what they focus their attention on. I always say this, we all go to a certain party and one of us goes directly to the buffet table. Wow, this is such a great feast. One person goes to you know, the living room and some people there are in huddles and he takes time to talk to everyone. Wow, great conversations, good learning inputs. I got updated with certain trends in some industries. One person goes to the pool where people are frolicking in the water. Wow, this is fun. This is exciting. This is such a, you know, energized party. One person goes to the garden, the darker side of the, the, the compound, and he saw, oh, certain partners getting connected. Wow, it's a great party. It's a time to connect romantically. See, so we all go home and we have a very different perspective of the party. But it's one party. So, what happened? Our characterization of the party is a function of what we focused on. And isn't that what life is all about? What you focus on will actually be the definition that you have. So, whether it's in, it's in business, whether it's in your work, in your job, you change what you can change. If you can change something for the better change it if you cannot accept it move forward accept it and move forward now for the people who lost you know some people will always say rex how can you say i cannot be depressed you know i lost a son i lost a daughter i lost a parent and you know i am in grief i agree i sympathize the feeling of loss and grief is natural. We're human beings. Those emotions are unavoidable. But aren't we supposed to pick up the pieces and move from there? So resilient people don't lose what they have to people or to events they lost. Let me repeat that. Don't lose what you have to what you have lost. And I, this I learned from... One of the mentors I had, I lost my mom and 
He was there lunchtime when there were no people at the wake. He went to the wake lunchtime to spend a one-on-one -on -one session with me. He's the chairman of the film funds at that time, and the name is Paki Ortigas. He was the chairman. Paki lost his son, his only son. And he was devastated with that jet ski accident in their place in Calatagan. And I know it took him years in order to overcome that grief. But you see, that experience, he transferred to me in a few minutes. So I didn't have to go through the year that he went through. And I guess that's the reason why I can say I'm the person I am because I've had a lot of great mentors. I am where I am because I've always stood on the shoulders of giants. See, I didn't have to go through that experience because I had mentors and friends like him in my life who blessed me. And this is what he shared with me. He said, Rex, I know you lost your mom and it, it really feels so sad. And you know, I lost my son and that's, my God, that's, that's worse. Normal occurrence in life, you bury a parent. But it's not life's normal occurrence for a parent to bury a child. It's very different. But this is what I learned from overcoming a year of depression and grief. He said, think about what you have, not about what you lost. I had an only son that was with me 30 plus years. I grieve because for the rest of my life, I'm not going to be having him. He's sorely going to be missed. But you see, what am I focusing on? The years that he's not going to be with me anymore? Or can I focus on the 30 plus years that he celebrated his life with me? My life was blessed with his presence. My life was enriched by his presence. Can you just imagine if I didn't have a son for 30 years? How empty could that have been? Those were so powerful words. What he's telling me is, yes, you lost your mom, but can you just imagine not having all of those years with your mom? Not having all of those experiences with your mom? Do not lose that. You don't lose that. You don't lose what you have with the person you lost. Those things that are special to you. Cherish memories, all the lessons of life. The happiness, the fun that you had when you were together. You don't lose those. They stay with you. And with that, immediately perspectives change. That's how resilient people think. And I hope that kind of helps you because that's very, very powerful. You tune in to what's good in your world. See, when you seek the wrong things, you'll find them. Oh, my companies now work from home. I don't know how to you know, engage doing this. I mean, uh, my, my supervisor is not, is not guiding me well. Oh, my workers are not doing their job. See, if you're looking for the wrong things, you will find them. Try to look for the good stuff. And the good stuff is the good stuff you magnify and you optimize on. That's how you become more resilient. Resilient people ask themselves, is what I'm doing helping or hurting me? This is a very powerful question. Whatever you're doing now, is that hurting or helping you? And be very frank about it. You see, when you put yourself in a situation that you can get out of something that's hurting you, then you control that situation. You put yourself in control of the decision-making process. You are in action. See, if you're doing something that helps you, you become better. If you're doing something that hurts you, then get out of there, do something else. And this is something that not a lot of people do. Take responsibility and accountability. You know, the reason why many of us are in depression and anxiety, the reason why many of us are unproductive in our work, 
It's because the automatic reaction is to blame somebody else. You see, when you blame someone else, guess what happens? You don't empower yourself to react. You cannot decide. Why? It's somebody else's fault. Why will you act? That is the worst part of the blame game. When you blame someone else, you're not in a position of power because that person has the fault. And if he has the fault, then you don't have to do anything. Wow. Is that a way of becoming more resilient? I'm so sure you now think it's the opposite, right? So if you take responsibility and accountability, things change immediately. You now understand to become more productive and constructive. That's powerful, isn't it? So am I doing something that hurts me or something that helps me? Ask yourself that question today and maybe immediately you're going to be on your road to resilience. Let's shift now. Firing on all cylinders based on business. Firing on all cylinders based on business. See, we all have this notion of what we call business models. We have business models. And this is probably one of the best business models I can share with you. And this is something that works whether you're in a pandemic or not. See, what do you offer the customer? What is the value proposition? Out of the value proposition, you have to answer the how. What's your value chain? How do you create that value proposition? Then you decide for whom. Who is your target customer? Who is your target market? And once your what, how, and who are done, then you now think about how do you create that value? How do you now earn from it? How does the business model generate profit? You now have a revenue model. So this is such a great canvas for your business. Question, how did the pandemic change that? You want to fire up on all your cylinders within the pandemic for your business? Analyze and reanalyze this for your business and the work that you do. Because there are certain facets that move, variables that change because of COVID. And you have to react to that because this model can change. And when this model can change, then you have to respond. I'll tell you, I've just had one of the best parties I attended a few weeks ago, exactly three weeks ago. It's my mother-in-law's, my mother's 80th birthday. And you know, they just announced the ECQ and we cannot celebrate, we cannot party. But we should, we know the family we knew we must celebrate this. It's a very special occasion. So we came up with a Zoom party. We came up with a Zoom party with a program. It was a surprise. It was great. It was well organized. Great host. I was the host. <laughs> it was fun. But what's the highlight? You cannot have any party in the Filipino sense if you don't have anything to feed your guests. So my sister-in-law contacted Flora Bells. Flora Bells, as you well know, is a great place to dine. They also cater. But this is a very different situation. What can we do about it? All told, the guys in Flora Bell change this value proposition. It's not just a great food and great dining experience because we're not going to be doing it in a physical place. So what did they do? They changed the value proposition. Great tasting food packaged in a festive manner, in a real you know, set of colors that even moves anyone who looks at it. Food that is even 
the right color and the right combination. So even if you take them out in plastic packages, microwavable packages, they look wonderful. So much so that every family who were guests of that party took pictures of this delivery and shared it via Viber, Telegram, WhatsApp. Everybody just had a great time. And the value chain is also very important. Why? Because it's not just going to be great tasting food. It's food that looks good on the table after you unpack it. Guess how many restaurants get this wrong? You order delivery, you order a cake, they mess it up. They deliver it upside down or shaken up. Flora Bells made sure they control the delivery system. So how luxurious, how delicious the meal is, is exactly how good it was packed, how good it was packaged. Absolutely delightful for the eyes. But you see, they also made it a point that it get delivered really well. They took responsibility and accountability for the delivery. So much so that once it's on the table, it still looked good. So basically, they have moved and pivoted their value proposition and their value chain. So definitely, would we have paid higher for the meal? The answer is yes. But for the kind of convenience and the kind of delivery that was there, impeccable. Impeccable. You know, I don't know anyone from Florabels. I don't know anyone. Probably my sister-in-law would have them as a friend. But I was impressed. And basically with this, I'm actually now a raving fan, right? They're now getting a lot of you know, other clients from me because of the way I'm sharing them. But this is because of the way they fired on all their cylinders and positioned their business for power. You see, most of our markets... The demand is still there. Except for a few pockets out there where the real consumers lost jobs and lost salaries. For most part, there is demand in our markets. Demand is there. It just took a change in demand character. So we all have to adjust to that demand character. How are you adjusting to it? Are you adjusting to that demand character in a correct way? Or are you just allowing your businesses to go through and survive? What are the pivots that you're doing to make it even better? To make it a more sought after product or service? You see, firing on all cylinders doesn't mean firing on the same cylinders. You seek new cylinders you need to fire from. And if you take that kind of a perspective, guess what? Then COVID is here to make you better. COVID is here to make you stronger. COVID is here to actually make your business greater. It is not what happens, but what you do with what's happening that can actually change you for the better. I hope you get that point really well. Because there are things to happen, there are things to come after COVID. And what's there beyond the horizon? AI, you know, artificial intelligence is coming. The rise of ecosystems is your business utilizing or starting to do AI. If not, Maybe the other question is, will your business be in jeopardy because of AI? Will your business be on the wayside because of AI? AI will never replace the human touch. AI will never be a full substitute for human interaction. All I'm saying is this. Whether AI is your ally or your competitor, there is a way 
of responding to AI to increase the value of your service. Get yourself into a higher level of operation to make it more fruitful, more meaningful for people you serve. Are you part of ecosystems now? Or you're still standing on your own? Competition is the name of the game. There was a time when I was like competing with fund managers as I'm a fund manager myself. Today, I am in everybody's ecosystem because the world works very differently today. An investor doesn't want to invest in one product or in one service. He wants multitude of products and services. Do I compete with other people to do that? Or do I harness the capability of other people to be able to deliver that and be the focal point of all this? That's the crux of the business. We have to accept lower growth rates, but those growth rates will have to be consistent. Yes, there would be a blip, high growth, and then it will simmer down and hopefully create the legs that should be there for the next surge of growth. But after simmering down, we have to face up to the fact that there would be lower growth rates and we have to thrive with lower growth rates. Climate change, even the way we invest is going to be pushed by you know, ESG, environmental, social, and governance, and SDG, or sustainable development goals. I am so sure Philip Hagedorn in his topic will handle this very eloquently and comprehensively. I've listened to him do it and you know, you're going to be mesmerized in, 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 in the lessons that he's going to teach you. But that's going to be a part of the game. Adjustment of a tech society relationship. That's going to be a given. I think we're all into that right now. A decoupling of all the relationships in businesses that we all knew, there would be variables that will now move different directions. And obviously, we're into new ways of working. How are you responding to that new way of working? And there would be increased uncertainty moving forward. Is this, is this COVID the only crisis that we're looking at? How about future pandemics? How about future issues like calamities? So VUCA will be something here to stay. VUCA, which a lot of people thought was just a concept, is now in big, bold letters and in neon lights. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. The world we live in is becoming more complex. There are more variables. And because of that, the complexity is higher. The volatility becomes more tension-filled. Movements are brisk, abrupt. And because of all that, things end up to be more ambiguous. We don't know which relationships are connected anymore. Everything's almost unprecedented. We thought black swan was a black swan, right? But with the way things are happening in our world, black swans are becoming more frequent. So they're not exactly rare black swans. They are regular black swans. And we have to be ready for them. We have to be ready for them. We have to fire up our cylinders on our business. We have to be able to actively position ourselves on a daily basis. When I say this, it's grounding yourself and your people, your team, to do what needs to be done and more on a daily basis. I've been in my industry for the longest time, and I'll tell you, it all gets to you know, be summed up in one word, activity. Activity, activity, activity. You miss 100% of the shots you don't make. You miss 100% of the 100% of the shots you don't take. So you have to be active. I know batting averages will be lower. That's a given. But, but, the only way to make the shots is to take them. Lower, 
batting average, no problem. What does that mean? To make the same number of shots, I need to take more shots. How many of you call on your same number of customers? How many of you try to reach out to 30% more customers, to 100% more customers? Obviously, your sales are getting lower if you have the same level of activity. Because the coefficient of difficulty has increased, so the propensity for success is lower. So what happens? You have to do more. Because in doing more with a lower batting average, you either equal or grow your business moving forward. So how are you able to do this? Activity, activity, activity. Nothing changes. Effort is what needs to be done. See, I even ask financial, advi financial advisors out there, have you even gone through a day that you just called on your clients just to say hi and to see how they are? Nangumusta ka lang. That enhances relationships because they feel important whether or not you're selling them anything. How about your business? Do you touch base with your customers just to make sure they're okay, their family are well? Have you even commiserated and condoled with the people who are part of your customers who've lost friends and loved ones in this pandemic? Or have you disappeared completely? You're just going to show up for business. That's how we differentiate the good from the great. Activity, activity, and more activity. And that just means we go full out on new platforms. You see, Rambler Financials, my company, we weren't really heavy in social media. We're a face-to-face -face company. We pride ourselves in having advisory relationships with our high net worth clients and even not so high net worth clients. But because of this pandemic, guess what happened? We don't have a choice. We have to reach out to everyone. And all of a sudden, you know, we have a YouTube channel. We have been active in Instagram. We have a really great and creative marketing team who's, you know, re rehashed our website and then changed our Facebook page just to be able to connect more effectively. And because of this, let me be very, very frank about it. Rapper Financials is a company you now know better within the pandemic than before it. Isn't that the truth? You see, we're more popular today than before the pandemic because of what we have done. And because people are online, it has become a cost-efficient way for us. It has become a way of connecting easier without transportation costs, without all of these you know, uh, hotels and, and restaurants where we make up our events and then come up with our celebrations. Everything's on Zoom, everything's online, everything's on social media. And because of that, the business is flourishing. We're not surviving. We are thriving. But you see, I am a salesman. Even if I'm the president and CEO of my company, I am not going to be ashamed to say I should be the number one salesman of my company. And I sell every opportunity I have. And I'm not going to let this pass. I'd like you to be a subscriber to our channel. I'm going to invite you because it's going to be good for you. We're going to be having market updates, insights, latest product recommendations, personal tips, things that will make you do better in your life journey. Growth, lessons, many, many more. So for those of you, please screenshot this QR code. Get directly to our YouTube channel and subscribe and watch the videos that are there. And it's almost like you get value compared 
to the entertainment, telenovelas, video clips that you watch. Yes, they make you smile at times, but that's temporary. How will entertainment make you grow after the pandemic? How will entertainment and all of these things that you put your time on make you become a better person today and in the future? So let's also be selective in the data, in the information that we consume. We have to be proactive in choosing. Now, I'm not going to say don't get entertainment. There's no problem with that. But balance it off. Balance it off with things that can make you learn and grow. Because that's a requirement to make you a better person moving forward. That's a requirement to fire on all your cylinders. So that within the pandemic and after it, you become a better, greater person. Let's move on to firing on all cylinders for investments. Yes, for those of you who are part of the markets, wow, you've suffered this. That's a big, big drop from a very optimistic January, start of the year, very optimistic. All of a sudden, kaput, minus 15%. New surge, ECQ, stricter quarantine protocols, delayed vaccinations. And people want to avoid investing altogether. Wrong. You know what I can tell you that this can be expected? If you're going to be looking at the market from an educated point of view, hey, think about this. Look at this. From March of 2020 to January of this year, that's an increase of 53%. Will it be healthy for a market to go grow parabolic from there? That's not going to be healthy. It is healthy to have a 15% correction because you've actually increased by 53%. The new surge, the stricter quarantine protocols, they are new storylines and great excuses for the correction that the market needs to have greater legs or another move upwards. That's the name of the game. That's the rule of markets. How come we cannot expect it? Aren't we supposed to expect that? So when you expect them, you're going to be more resilient. Because you can respond to them. You know they're going to happen. For the people who deny and suppress and, and you know not do anything about it, obviously their portfolios are not going to be resilient. As I've said, I'll probably be the oldest amongst all the crop of speakers. And I can tell you that I'll probably be also the more experienced as far as crisis is concerned. How many crises have I gone through in my career? And because of that, I knew that those crises were the best times to earn money. I did not learn that in the early crises that I've been part of. But since I learned that moving forward, I've always taken advantage of crises to put my best foot forward balance a real growth portfolio so that when the recovery happens, I actually optimize on it. I maximize on the opportunity. What have you been doing with your investments? Are you firing on your cylinders for your investments? But it's not enough that we stop with the markets and the investments we're in. It's high time we learn diversification. We have to go multi-market, multi-geography, multi-asset. The blessing that we all have, ladies and gentlemen, is that we can do it now without having millions of dollars in our portfolio. That's again another blessing. That's again another part of this. You know, when I was a lot younger, to get myself involved in global assets, I need a huge amount of money in dollars. I need to have a relationship with a private banker. I need to have foreign accounts. 
you can now do this for as low as 1,000 pesos, for as low as $2,000. How come people are not doing it? Because they don't know. They're not proactive enough to learn that there are options. You're complaining about the bad Philippine market. The U.S. market is at record highs. So if you're partly involved in technology and the U.S. market, part of your portfolio should be doing well. And maybe the question you need to ask yourself is, why aren't you investing there with all of the instruments that are out there? Maybe you should need to go to that YouTube channel of Ramper to learn how we can help you. Multi-asset, multi-geography, multi-market. It can be done now. And it can be so simply done now. You can do it directly if you want, or you can go through managed funds so you don't even have to manage it yourself. It can be done. But you see, don't you notice it's all a matter of discipline? It's all a matter of putting ourselves in the situation where we can optimize and maximize. It's not a pandemic. It's you. What are you doing? Now, people are saying, whoa, I'm a part of crypto now. I'm part of real estate now. I have a real estate component in my portfolio. Great. Great that you're doing all of these things. But are you putting your eggs in one basket? Or are you even having an asset allocation that matches your goals? Are you positioning investments just to make more money? Maybe the question I need to ask is, for what? If you invest to make more money, you're going to throw risk out the window. When you throw risk out the window, this is going to be ending up like a sad story. I'll tell you, 90% of people who invest and trade lose money because they miss out on this reality. That asset allocation is the driver for long-term portfolio performance. Again, for those of you who are in crypto, you know, Tony Erbosa will be speaking later on. That's a great new asset. But will I put everything on it for my future? Maybe that's another story. So if I'm going to be putting myself in a very orderly way of matching up my goals with the asset allocation program that I have for my portfolio, achieving what I want, fulfilling all of my dreams will be a matter of when. Not a matter of if, a matter of when. Because everything's so programmed. The driver of performance is not security selection, not market timing. It is asset selection. And as of the moment, they say, oh, cryptocurrency is now a real asset class. So when you say that, then part of your portfolio should be in cryptocurrency. But you have to learn this. It's not a matter of hearing someone, okay, he earned a little more money with that or he doubled his money, I should be there too. Now, that's the wrong driver for involvement in investment. A real driver is to put it as part of a base that fulfills what you want to happen, the goals and dreams of your financial track. And yes, I agree. Cryptocurrency can be a new asset class. Goldman Sachs has already said it. However, the discipline in me tells me that I have to understand it before I invest. It's not just putting money everywhere. What is it all about? You know, two, three years ago, I dismissed this. Two, three years ago, I dismissed it. Until I was in a conversation in an elevator with one of my best, foremost idols in investments and finance. The name, Christine Lagarde, previous finance minister of France, became the president of the IMF. In an elevator in Vietnam for an investment conference, she said that cryptocurrency can be much like the internet. We diss it, we dismiss it very early until it becomes our way of life. So don't do that. Try to understand it. And ever since that time, I've been trying to understand. I've been trying to study. I did not put a big, big chunk of money 
but I put enough. You know, one of my lessons, right? You know, one of my concepts without skin in the game, you don't actually do well. You don't learn something just by studying it. You have to put money in it. And that's exactly what I did. But you see, I understood Bitcoin, digital gold. Okay, it's a store of value. Great store of value that has now become an accepted asset class across institutions. However, as Warren Buffett would say, no particular functionality. You buy Bitcoin today, hoping someone will buy it at a higher price from you later on. What's the productivity of the coin? Nothing. It's a store of value. That's why Warren Buffett doesn't like it. What has commercial and transactional value? That's Ethereum. Ethereum has an ecosystem. But Ethereum, Ethereum's technology is outdated. That's why they're trying to launch Ethereum 2.0. Because the number of smart contracts they can run, the number of transactions per second, very limited. But even with Ethereum 2.0, they're going to come up with what? A few hundreds of transactions per second? That's the reason why I tell you, I study. And I'm not endorsing this because it's a favorite or I'm connected, but I'm endorsing you know, cryptocurrency in a sense because it has to be part of your portfolio now. That's what the fund managers say. But if ever I'm going to be putting a bigger chunk, it's something I have to know. And that's the reason why I began to study Cardano. Cardano is actually developed by that same guy who was part of Ethereum. He got out of Ethereum and developed Cardano to be another altcoin that has its own ecosystem. And that ecosystem, by far, based on my own research and knowledge, is by far one of the most comprehensive with liquidity, NFTs, payments, even insurance, stablecoin, lending and borrowing. The, the problem with Cardano is that not everything is delivered yet. Some of it will be delivered in a few months, some of it within the year, some of it next year, and the years moving forward. But that also tells you that it will have a way of increasing with, in value, much like Ethereum has done. But did I stop in terms of researching and finding information? No, I didn't. I went straight ahead. I will exert effort and I will only put in substantial money when I know more, when I appreciate and understand more. So I didn't stop. I even talked to the guy himself. Through a group of friends and officers, we had a great chat with Charles Hopkinson, the great, admired, revered Charles Hopkinson. Hoskinson is so admired within the cryptocurrency world. My pride that I've met with him and I'm meeting with him once again in May 31, I heard. There's already a schedule. So that's the kind of discipline we'd want in investing. It's not just getting exposed to asset classes because they can give you an avenue to profit more. No, it's understanding them and matching them up with a flavoring of a portfolio that will be geared up towards the fulfillment of financial dreams. That's the concept and principle that's foundational. Learn before you earn. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like us to look at it and look at it very comprehensively. As a reason why I don't have a propensity to say this is a great investment, that's a better investment than that. I will always tell people each investment instrument plays a role in a portfolio. You want to optimize personal net worth and estate values, you have to analyze the way you characterize your portfolio. And each and every product matches up with a particular need. So there is no perfect 100% best product for you for all the needs you have as a person. There would be 
a particular product addressing a need. And that's why you need to have a vibrant, robust portfolio that to review and develop from time to time. I guess, and I hope that gets you into firing on all of your cylinders in investing. Moving to probably the most important aspect of your life that you need to fire on in this pandemic. It's our family and our relationships. This pandemic gave me the chance to have dinner in the house 100% of the time. For many of you who know, before the pandemic, I'd probably be lucky to spend one weekday dinner in the house. Lucky to have that. But my commitments are, is to be with them for the weekends if I'm not on travel, and to be with my significant other in a very committed, solid schedule within the week for our dinners. But for the rest of the week, I'm off for business, I'm up for my endeavors. The pandemic brought us together daily for more than a year now. For some people, they thought of it as jail. They thought of it as being constrained. When will I be ever going to go out? For us, it was great. We had meaningful experiences together deeper conversations, secrets out on the table. We put ourselves in situations where we can help each other out. And let me tell you, I learned more from my children in this past year than I've ever learned from them ever since they were born. These are digital natives. And you know me, I'm a digital immigrant. Jurassic, right? So my view of business, my view of investments changed because of the way they changed me. But every day, every day, we had the opportunity to celebrate each other. We had the opportunity to celebrate together. How are you thinking about being in your home with the people who are special in your life? Maybe no umpisa, maganda pa. Sometimes we get fed up with it. You see, you get fed up with it because you've made it routine. Nothing is routine on our end. We're trying almost always to check things out. What will we do this weekend? What's a new movie to watch? What card game can we play? Can we go karaoke? Can we do a cookout? Can we challenge each other? See, all of those things. We've done because we had all the time. We took trips. We have homes in Subic, in Anvaya, some other places. We even had a bubble. We had an experience in El Nido. But you see, when you fire on all your cylinders, it's not just whiling the time away. It's also making them productive. Do you do group sessions? Do you do one-on-one -on -one sessions? You can also ask your children the right questions to clarify about the way they've thought about their future, about the way you can probably support them in the best way. You see, how can you support children when you don't know what they want to do? How can you support children when you don't know what their dreams are? Talk to them. Ask them questions. And you know what you'll get to realize? That there is another highway that will also emerge. It's a highway where they ask you how they can help you as well. How can they make your life better? And my children are of a certain age where they now also make me grow. So as a family with a loving wife that is practically, wow, amazed us with, with all of these, you know, dishes and cuisines that we never imagined. We never tasted that before. 
but it's never ending. The magic continues. And that's the reason why this whole pandemic is not a depressing experience. It's a wonderful, enjoyable experience where we had the best of our business, the best of our investments, and the best of our family surfacing. Surfacing to even improve, develop, and become greater. Are you firing on all your cylinders that this also happened to you, your family, and your life? I end this with this statement. I've been through a lot, and I know that times like this would be the best time to optimize. The stars shine brightest when the night is darkest. Never let a good crisis go to waste. A good crisis will be better for you if you want to be great. Pain can be a better teacher than success. Failure is a better teacher than triumphs. So ladies and gentlemen, friends, I hope this Icon 2021 can get you into that fork in your life where you make decisions on business, investments, and family that will make you a better person than the very individual who got into the pandemic. Maraming maraming salamat po. I wish you all the very best. I hope your family stays healthy and well moving forward. And God bless you all, always. Thank you.